Um, did you ask him if he would be um, happier behind us? Because he said that he would be happy, um, happy if he could see her. Did you ask him if he would be happy if he could he would, We didn't ask him specifically that, but every day when we went in to examine him, he was miserable, can't see, kept saying, can't see, can't see. You would ask him how he's feeling, can't see, can't. He was clearly upset about it, and as I say that one question, we asked him if he could somehow go to sleep and wake up, he clearly indicated that he would want to see. Yes? Um, I would say that the best option, in my opinion, would be to go through the procedure against his will, because though there's a risk of, you know, some negative effects to the anesthetic, um, if there was no procedure, then there's almost a guarantee, especially since he was unable to cope with his blindness, that he would come to some self-harm. Or, like, he would stand to benefit from the procedure, but he wouldn't necessarily stand to benefit from the main one. What if he developed a complication from the procedure? Again, we have to put him to sleep. It's a low risk, but it wasn't, it's not 100% risk-free. Would you still be willing to and weighing the risks versus the benefits, which is what we always try to do. Yeah, um, I think that even considering that risk, I think that going through with the procedure would be better because it would give him some chance of coming through with a benefit. And if he remains blind, mm -hmm. there isn't necessarily a chance of a benefit. Is there anybody here who feels we should not violate his wishes? Would you like to make the yes ma'am? I think that they should definitely not do it because then there, there's a risk and it's not really big. But then when you have something that's a bigger risk, like where do you draw the line? Which so is the bigger risk? Like if there's someone who has a ruptured appendix, mm -hmm. and then like would you give it to them or not if they didn't want to do it? Well, there it's a question of life and death though with the ruptured appendix. I know, but there's still a risk. so. It is, but there's no risk. If we don't do the operation, we'll be dead for sure, almost for sure. So there, I think, I think most people would say that rather than let somebody die, a 25-year-old psychotic man who could be cured with a simple operation, or let them die, I think most people would say that when life is in the balance, you go against the wishes. But this is a quality of life question about the site. Yes, we all want to see, but he could live being blind as well. And does that again justify going against his wishes? Yes, sir. At the same time, he stated that Norman couldn't cope with his blindness, which means that he couldn't read Braille, he didn't have a seeing eye dog, or a cane to help facilitate his walking. Which means that if Norman decided to leave the hospital without the treatment being done, he would end up getting himself injured, which would end his life. That's a very good. That's a very good point. Now, in, uh, in response to your point, we were not about to let Norman leave the hospital. We would have coerced him to go to the nursing home because we felt that the risk to him, you're absolutely right, his walking in front of a truck was so great that it was a life, and, and in that case, overcoming his autonomy, and he didn't necessarily express a wish not to go to a nursing home. I think the place that would give him three meals and a warm bed, he would have been okay. But your point is well taken, but just to tell you that we would not have let this man out on the street. But that's not the same, of course, in coercing him to the surgery. <coughs> let me take one more comment, and then I'll tell you the end of the story and tell you the next case. Um, somebody from that side, yes? Yes? Um, like, the solution that I have is not, like, really, like, it might not help a lot, but, like, don't, can't you, um, like, ask him for his fingerprints and maybe run him through a system to see if maybe he, like, committed a crime or, or at least, like, been stopped by police, something like that? You know, I, I'm going to have some of your people join my committee. <laughs> that is precisely what we did. Yeah. Give this lady a large bar. <laughs> When somebody made a million things, they'd give that man a Mars bar. It's like a candy. Anyway, we, we had a social worker who called the police. And actually, she was very persistent because the first she called many times, they didn't come. The police finally came, and they fingerprinted Norman. And they identified Norman. He had had a couple of brushes with the law over some trivial things. And we were able to identify him, and we were able to call up his 
sister who lived in Rochester, I believe, and when she got the call, she cried because she hadn't heard from her brother in 10 years, and we had found Norman. And not only that, but the sister was his legal guardian. And so a legal guardian has the right to make, give permission for surgery. So uh, I, I should tell you, first of all, that I was of the opinion personally of coercing him into the surgery. I felt that the risk benefit here was so huge, I could think of no operation that would improve quality of life more than restoring somebody's sight from being blind. I mean, you know, it's nice to have your wrinkles removed and Botox shots and so <laughs> forth. And, and, but when you're talking about blindness and sight, I can think of almost nothing that would be as great. And the risk was so little that I felt from an ethical point of view that this would be appropriate. But uh, we were saved to have to do that. And as a matter of fact, we wouldn't because the lawyer said we couldn't do it because the law, they said, stated that unless it was a question of life and death, we could not coerce somebody, even, again, who had no capacity. But anyway, we identified him. We called his sister. She said, of course, take him for surgery. We took him to surgery. He had his cat, you do one at a time. We took out a cataract. And we came and I visited Norman afterwards. And for the first time, he was smiling. He was happy that he could see. He had the television on. He was ignoring me. He was looking at the television set. And Norman eventually did go to a nursing home where he had his other eye operated on, eventually not at the nursing home, but in another hospital. And so uh, he is uh, he lived happily ever after. I mean, I don't know what happened. I'm, I'm certain that he was a, but he, it was clear that he was very happy to be able to see. And I think that his sister, this, it ultimately it boiled down to the legal issue of whether or not we could carry this out legally. He said he was about 50 years old. He said he had a wife and three kids. All of the stuff he told us was absolutely not true. You know, his sister, sister said that he had been a schizophrenic since youth and had been in and out of hospitals and had a few minor issues with the police and so on. But the issue of the fingerprinting, brilliant idea. Let me tell you one other case. And then, do I have time for one other case? Okay. This is a case, another actual case. We had a situation where we had a man who was brought to the hospital with brain trauma, trauma to his head. Um, and he was unconscious. He was put on a respirator. We put a breathing tube in his lungs. He was put on a respirator. And um, the circumstances of, his, uh, of this were not clear. It would, he, he was found at home by the police after his wife called because she was not home that night. She was made on two homes. And the police came in the apartment and there was uh, blood and, and a, a liquor bottle that was empty. And it looked as if there had been a lot of uh, commotion and so forth. Um, he was in the hospital and uh, it was clear that he had sustained serious head trauma and he had bleeding in his brain. And the wife of this patient was also his, what we call a healthcare proxy or a healthcare agent. What that means is this. If I lose capacity to be able to make decisions about what should or should not be done to me, I can appoint anybody that I want. This is a New York State law. I can appoint anybody I want to be my healthcare agent. That person has the legal power to make decisions about my medical care, yes operation, no, even to withdraw life support. Because the law says that when I lose capacity, I should not be deprived of the right of making life and death decisions about myself. But since I can't make it, I'm given the opportunity ahead of time when I have capacity to appoint somebody in writing. It's a form that says I appoint so-and-so, there are two witnesses, it's a simple form. That person now has the legal right to say what should or should not be done. 